tonight? Angry Eight. What's the problem? Um, I just need him to come. Is your husband there? No. Well, what's the problem? Well, I need him to come. <laughs> I need to know why we're talking now. <laughs> Is the bear sitting next to you? Or no. she? Or me? Are you having a disturbance? Are you ill or what? Uh, yes, I'm ill. You need an ambulance? No, I need a police officer. We're going to bring you some breaking news now out of the Clear Lake area. Houston police say they were called to check out a welfare. Andrea, has not yeah, been charged just, woman just woman yet. We do know that within the last couple of hours, it happened in the house you see behind me here. The father is a NASA engineer. Police say while he was at work, his wife drowned their five children. You loved your children? Five precious children, one struggling mother. What Andrea Yates did on June 20th, 2001 inside her home stunned the nation. The then 36 year old mother called 911 herself to report she had drowned her children. The years that followed were no less dramatic, an overturned conviction based on false testimony and a second trial that sent Andrea to a state hospital where she remains today. All of it shined a light on mental illness and exposed Andrea's demons that led to her children's deaths. We get a call around 9.30, around about 9.30, 9.35, somewhere around there. A nice clear day and nice day. And didn't expect that at all, of course, but you never do. On the morning of June 20th, 2001. She had breakfast on the table. They were eating cereal. 36-year-old Andrea Yates waited for her husband to leave for work, fed her children breakfast. I checked and the milk was cold. And then one by one took them to the bathroom and drowned them. I forgot how the call came in. I think it may have just came in as a you know, respond to the sick call or I don't think it came in as a, I know it didn't come in as a drowning. John Del Bosque. I'm the paramedic who pronounced them. A Houston firefighter paramedic for 36 years responded. There was a police officer that may have beaten me there maybe about five minutes before I did. And uh, as he walks out, first thing he says to me is, uh, she killed all of them. And when she, he said that, I, I had no idea. I thought maybe mom, dad, husband, family, no idea of what, she, what he meant by that. So uh, I walked in and uh, that's when I found the, the four kids in the, in the bedroom, uh, all lined up and she had covered them. She didn't cover her, their heads, just up to their neck. And you can see all the, the, their faces. And they look like, the, to me, they look like little porcelain dolls. Four children, five-year-old John, three-year-old Paul, two-year-old Luke, and six-month-old Mary, who was cradled in John's arm, all dead. Dobosky thought they had been poisoned. Seven-year-old Noah was still in the bathroom. As I was walking out, I saw a trail of water. And when I saw the trail of water, I kind of followed it and it led into the bathroom. And that's where I saw uh, the oldest child. Uh, I believe that was Noah, if I can remember correctly. And he was still in the bathtub, face down. He was just bobbing in the water. That's when I realized she drowned him. So yeah, that was that day. Seeing five, you know, deceased kids, babies, it's pretty difficult. It's pretty difficult to see that. So yeah, it's probably, well, obviously it was my worst call, I think. Yeah. It happened in For the most house you see the Soon media and more police descended on the 900 block of Beachcomber in Clear Lake, Texas, southeast of Houston. She killed her children. The children's father, Russell, Rusty Yates, rushed home. Del Bosque remembers his brief conversation with the woman whose actions would dominate headlines. She was in, on the couch, sitting on the couch, and I believe that that officer had her in handcuffs, and she was just sitting on the couch. Uh, just kind of glaring at the wall, real like in you know, a gaze, or like, hey, just like a little zombie, you know, just had no clue what she, I guess what she did, because she had no tears or anything like that. And we made small talk. She had a bus out back, and I asked her, I go, well, I really didn't ask her, I go, man, there's a bus out back. And she said, uh, yeah, we used to live in it. Andrea and Rusty, a NASA engineer, were married in 1993. Children soon followed. They moved from the converted bus to this modest home after Luke was born. Andrea homeschooled them. Her mental state was deteriorating. 
In 1999, she had a mental breakdown, overdosed, and was hospitalized. The first of four hospitalizations in two years. One doctor advised against having more children than Mary came in late 2000. I said, is anyone hurt? And she said, yes. And I said, I said, who? And she said, the children. Rusty quickly faced the cameras. A day after he lost all of his children, he clutched a family photo and voiced his support for Andrea. She, she loved those kids. Read up as much as I possibly could about women's mental health. George Parnum had been hired as her attorney hours earlier, a referral from a lawyer who knew her family. I just knew what it was about, so I hesitated to call him back. Uh, in the back of my mind, knowing that this would be a uh, mind-changing event in my legal life and personal life. Um, but I did, and I was right. And the next morning at 7.30, Andrea's mother, her two brothers, came into my office hired me, um, and 20 years later, here we are talking about her. Right? Pardon was not only her attorney, but a staunch advocate, and now, like family. She's like my daughter, yep. He educated himself about women's mental health and postpartum depression, and went on the interview circuit. It was important for me to try to level the playing field. He remembers his first interaction with Rusty. It was at the Harris County Jail. I feel a tap on the shoulders, Rusty. And he took out his hands and he said, well, I guess it's welcome to the team, you know, with a big grin on his face. And here this guy just lost his children, you know. Parna met Andrea that same day. The depths of her illnesses, her illness was, uh, overwhelming to me. I remember uh, so well looking and uh, at her and she had no pupils in her eyes. She didn't know why she needed a lawyer. Um, she believed that Satan lived within her and she for the benefit of mankind, wanted to be executed so that the ruler, as it is so stated in the Bible, and realistically as the governor of Texas, right, could execute Satan, and therefore she would be able to save the world from Satan. In interviews with police, Andrea said she killed her children because she was not a good mother. She told a county psychiatrist she wanted to save them from Satan. Why would Satan want you to do something that saved the children? Because the act would condemn you. Satan was interested in you and not the children? Right. There's no question but that, you know, Andrea's world at that time was her psychotic state. And when you're in a depth of psychosis, you make decisions based on that world that may otherwise not be an appropriate call. A jury would eventually hear the case. Was Andrea Yates a murderer or just a very ill woman? Either she knew right from wrong or she did not. And that's what we accomplished in the first trial, we, what we tried to do in the uh, second trial. Andrea Yates was unlike any defendant accused of such horrific crimes. She was the valedictorian of her high school class, the captain of her swim team. She was a nurse, a mother. Eight days after their deaths, the eight children were buried, five little coffins, a stunning sight. With five hearses parked outside, mourners filled the Clear Lake Church of Christ to hear Rusty Yates talk about his children. 
Flowers draped the white caskets holding the bodies of Noah, John, Paul, Luke, and baby Mary. Rusty described in great detail each child's personality and leaned on his strong faith to help him through. He did not mention his wife, Andrea Yates, who remained in jail on 24-hour suicide watch. Legal strategies were already being formed. I think the jury, um, looking at Andrea, can't imagine how a sane mother would do what Andrea did. Um, and so I think going in, there was a level basis for insanity. Andrea had attempted suicide twice, was admitted to psychiatric hospitals, and treated for postpartum depression and psychosis before the drownings. Early on, her attorney, George Parnum, revealed he was considering an insanity defense. A judge issued a gag order. There were questions about whether the state would seek the death penalty. The following February, her case went to trial. Our strategy basically was to um, uh, focus the jurors' attention on the law, the uh, uh, both the common sense definitions and how they correlated with the uh, scientific uh, definitions, and to make it a case that was simply, did she know right from wrong? That was all the state had to prove. Experts agreed that Andrea, with a history of mental illness, suffered from postpartum depression and schizophrenia, but defense and prosecution witnesses disagreed about how severe her illness was or whether it kept her from knowing right from wrong. We the jury. In March, she was convicted. The state wanted death. The jury sentenced her to life in prison. I want to know why nobody was there with Andrea. After the verdict, her family said Rusty shared some responsibility. She had little help at home and was in a downward spiral, they said. I said she is in no condition to be left alone or to drive. His reaction? He went and just did what he wanted to do. Testimony revealed Andrea's doctor discontinued the strong antipsychotic medication Haldol just 16 days before she killed her children. Obviously very um, disappointed in the, in the verdict. Rusty was guilty. never charged. He filed um, for divorce in 2004. Our family, we all stand behind Andrea. And I'm Tom Cook. In 2005, more than two years into Andrea's life sentence, a bombshell. Said to be shocked but happy today when she heard that her conviction had been overturned. We took it all the way up. An appeals court overturned Andrea's capital murder convictions and ordered a new trial. Joe Ombi, now retired and living in Kentucky, was the lead prosecutor. Park Dietz was our expert on the first case, and he was very well known. Um, uh, nationally, and he uh, testified that um, uh, one of the law and order programs had run a program which basically paralleled the situation we were in. And we also had a tidbit of information which we uh, was involved in a case that um, uh, Andre Yates habitually watched uh, Law and Order. Um, Park Dietz testified that uh, there had been an episode that kind of paralleled the events that we were, we were trying, and that turned out uh, not to be correct. Um, it was a surprise to me when the testimony came, uh, surprising because, uh, for one reason, because I had not asked the question and did not expect it to be part of either the direct or the cross-examination. Uh, turned out to be false. Uh, sometime later, uh, during the appeal, the case was overturned uh, because of the incorrect statement. Thank goodness Dr. Deitch did what he did. The next year, Andrea entered a not guilty by reason of insanity plea. Judge Belinda Hill granted her a $200,000 bond, but only if she checked herself into Rusk State Hospital in East Texas. George Parnum took a quick detour to his law partner, Wendell Odom's ranch. I get Andrea and she goes to the fence and the cows are there, right? Wendell's cows. And she uh, pats one on the head. And uh, we get back in the car, and I take her to Rusk, 
A lot of people don't know that until now. <laughs> in June 2006, Andrea was back in Houston for a second trial. Now 42, she often stared blankly during testimony. Her family was always in attendance. Rusty, now her ex-husband, was there too. A month later and after 13 hours of deliberations, a jury found that Andrea was insane when she drowned her children and acquitted her of capital murder. Mental health, I think, has been addressed. That's so important. Andrea was ordered to a state mental hospital in Kerrville on the edge of the Texas Hill Country, has been home for more than a decade. She's where she wants to be. She's where she needs to be. And, um, I mean, hypothetically, where would she go? What would she do? Here at Kerrville State Hospital, Andrea attends group therapy and one-on-one -on -one counseling. She has a job. There are no bars or barbed wire. A green line shows patients the boundaries. Parnum still talks to her on the phone and sometimes visits. In not guilty by reason of insanity, the court has jurisdiction for as long as her sentence would have been. In Andrea's case, that's the rest of her life. She comes up for review every year. Parnum says she has waived it every single time. I think she's afraid and concerned about being in a community. Um, certainly her notoriety and the issues that she brings will cause people to have um, harshness toward her. He says she's gotten death threats. Even 20 years later, they've never talked about that day. Why go there? You know, there's, there's no reason for that. At 80 years old, George Parnum is still practicing law. This is a case that will always be in my frontal lobe. He has supported the Yates Children Memorial Fund to educate people on women's mental health. Andrea's case has brought awareness to mental illness. This is such a major part of my legal existence. Uh, not only her case, but the aftermath of cases like hers. Uh, and I just want juries to understand the mindset, right? That's critical. Rusty Yates did not respond to our requests for an interview. He still lives in the Houston area. He has one child from a second marriage and is now divorced. Andrea is now 56 years old. She has spent almost a third of her life institutionalized. George Parnum says she is happy. All of the couple's children, if they had survived, would have been in their 20s. Parnum still visits the children's graves and often gets asked what he hopes for Andrea. His answer is simple, whatever makes her comfortable. 20 years later, he remembers her first words to him. She leaned forward. And she said, whispered something and I, I had to lean forward to hear what she said. And she said, please don't leave me alone. We the jury find and that's, and I have it. Not guilty by reason, by reason of insanity.